my roommate was always weird. And mean. Not gonna lie, I never really liked him too much. He's in his mid-thirties. He has long, greasy hair and a generous beer gut. Not to mention a serious temper. But that's not what I'm here to discuss. I'm here to discuss the rotten food he keeps in the fridge. Brian is a line cook at a dumpy dive that passes itself off as exotic cuisine. So it's not unusual for him to bring home peculiar looking and smelling food. Each week, something strange appears inside the fridge. Witchy grub, blood sausages, sun chokes, fiddleheads, mashua. You get the picture. Truth be told, I can't identify most items, and I'm too afraid to ask. Now, don't get me wrong. People can eat whatever the hell they want. No problems here. I'm just setting the stage. Remember, Brian has a nasty temper. The last thing I want to do is send him off into another fit of rage. That's what the previous roommate did. And he was sent to the hospital, suffering from multiple stab wounds. I wish the landlady had told me this prior to moving in. So back to the refrigerator. Not only is Brian a raging alcoholic, have I mentioned that yet? He's also a serious slob. Throwing out stale food doesn't seem to occur to him. Ever. I swear, there's a pickle jar that expired before the goddamn lockdown. And don't get me started on the moldy block of cheese that's bluer than a muddy water song. Ugh, I can go on and on. But I'll try to be brief. I'm running out of time. The top shelf of the fridge is mine. So is the bottom left drawer. Unlike Brian, I keep my part of the fridge clean. So, needless to say, when the jar appeared, I was unimpressed. Initially, the jar was only mildly unusual. And gross. Brian must have stolen it from work. At first, I paid little attention to it. What's one more vile item rotting in the fridge? Last week, everything changed. It was New Year's Day. I was hungover as hell. Now, don't get the wrong impression, I'm no alky, unlike Brian, but I do indulge on holidays. And since entering my thirties, the consequences of my indulgences are much more severe. Our landlady threw a New Year's Eve party, giving us a chance to bond as roommates. You see, I work long hours, so I don't see Brian and Ethan, my other roommate, more about him later, too often. We drank and sang karaoke and did plenty of shots. That's all I remember. Sometime in the wee hours of the morning, I crawled out of bed in search of a tall drink of OJ. I was hurting. Bad. I won't go into detail, but I'm sure you can relate. If not, better for you. Next to the juice jug on my side of the fridge was the jar. It was sickly green, almost black. And it was bubbling. I moved it to Brian's side of the fridge, where it belonged. Then I grabbed the juice jug and poured half its contents down my throat. The juice jug was sticky. Gooey grossness glistened along its bottom and sides, thanks to whatever was lurking inside the jar. I gagged. The gag gave way to vomit, and I rushed into the bathroom. Ugh, I hadn't been this hungover in years. When I passed through the kitchen, ready for my nice warm bed, the fridge door was ajar. Weird, I'm sure I closed it. Not only that, but the juice jug was on the floor, leaking. I groaned as I set about mopping up the spilled juice. When I returned the nearly empty juice jug to the fridge, I saw Brian's jar was still bubbling away. I shook my aching head, then stumbled back to bed. I was too sick and tired for any of this. The following morning, and by morning I mean late noon at least, I got up and prepared a fresh pot of coffee. By now I'd forgotten the mysterious jar. That is, until I reached inside the fridge for milk. The jar was now on the side shelf, next to the ketchup bottle, bubbling away. Only now, an eyeball was floating in it. I gasped and hit my head on the fridge. The milk jug slipped from my fingers and spilled across the kitchen floor. Anger came quickly. I griped as I set about mopping up the milky mess. That's when I remembered what had happened earlier. What's the deal with the jar? By now, Brian was seriously pissing me off. I'd had enough of his disgusting eating habits, lack of hygiene, and cleanliness. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm a reasonable person. Typically, I don't cry over spilled milk. 
don't sweat the small stuff, right? Part of me was embarrassed at my reaction. Maybe I was overreacting. Still, my roommate was growing on my nerves. So was the jar. Brian finally stumbled out of his bedroom around dinner time. He looked as bad as I felt, maybe worse. His long hair was in disarray, exposing his increasing baldness lurking underneath. He looked at me and farted. Then he reached into the fridge and grabbed something so hideous I could not identify it. Not if you paid me a million dollars. He made toast. I watched with revulsion as he spooned the sticky spread onto his stale toast, then shoveled it into his big mouth. Again, he farted. That's when I retreated into the living room. I wanted to bring up the jar. You know, the one with the floating eyeball. But I chickened out. Spending the first week of 2024 in the hospital was not on my list of things to do. Brian ate, then tossed his dirty dish into the sink, where it would stay for the remainder of the week, maybe longer. Then he grabbed a tall boy from the fridge and returned to his bedroom. By now, Ethan emerged. He was chatting on his phone with his girlfriend, quarreling about something he did wrong. I didn't want to disturb him or eavesdrop, so I put on my earbuds, flopped on the couch, and got lost in Peaky Blinders. Sometime later, I fetched myself a snack. When I opened the fridge, I froze, not believing my eyes. The jar, which was on my side of the fridge, was open. The smell was unforgivable. Worse than rotten eggs. Worse than Brian's farts. Dark green slime was dripping down its side. I gagged and rushed to the toilet. Ugh, this was not the way I'd envisioned starting off 2024. I tiptoed back to the fridge. I was scared. Downright terrified, in fact. Something about the jar was unsettling. I had to get to the bottom of it. This time, before opening the fridge, I smartly shoved my nose under my shirt. The fridge swung open on its own. The jar was now on the top shelf, bubbling like a witch's brew. Even with my face covered, the stench was overpowering. Suddenly, food was the furthest thing from my mind. Yet, I stood transfixed, unable to move. And no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't keep my eyes off the jar. How could I? It was staring right back at me. The eyeball was hazel brown, completely bloodshot, and had long, curvy lashes like spider legs. When it blinked, my heart nearly exploded. Anger engulfed me. Not only that, I was scared shitless. I had to do something. It was now or never. I stood trembling outside Brian's bedroom door, conjuring up the nerve to knock. Finally, I did. What do you want? He griped. The door swung open. Brian was watching a podcast in his underwear, while sipping from his tall boy and fiddling with his phone. I, uh... Suddenly I was lost for words. How do I broach the subject of the insidious jar? Brian's a big fella. Mean as a junkyard dog. What the hell is in that jar of yours? The words blurted from my mouth. Huh? He looked up, then stumbled towards me, snarling. Which one? Good question. There were other jars. All disgusting. But only one jar contained a blinking eyeball. Only one jar moved on its own and reeked like a rotting corpse. I sighed. I'll show you. He followed me into the kitchen, still in his underwear. His face was anything but friendly. When I tried opening the fridge, it wouldn't budge. The door was stuck. What the? Brian shoved me aside and opened the fridge. To my dismay, the jar was closed and shoved way at the back behind a rotten head of lettuce. It may not have been lettuce, but that's the closest description I can think of. The jar belched. The smell was putrid. A smell that could end a marriage. There, I pointed. What, this? He reached in and fetched the jar. Here, have a look for yourself. I was shaking. The last thing I wanted was to touch the damn thing. Brian opened the jar. 
thick black steam wafted from the jar. The steam took form and attacked me. I blacked out. When I came to, I was back in bed, tucked neatly under the covers. My ears were ringing and my nose was raw, breathing hurt. It was nighttime. I was fully awake and only slightly hungover. Grumbling, I scurried into the living room where Brian and Ethan were drinking beer and watching some cheesy horror flick from the 80s. Well, well, Brian teased. Look what the cat dragged in. He winked. I nearly died. Everything hit me at once. It was his eyeball inside the jar. I'm sure of it. Sounds crazy, I know, but it's true. True was the words I'm spewing onto the screen. My mind went sideways. I almost passed out again. Instead, I beelined it for the kitchen, straight for the fridge. My hands trembled as it opened. Aha! I shouted, either aloud or in my mind. The jar was gone. Not only that, but for the first time since I'd moved in, the fridge was clean. I sighed. The rational part of me told me that I dreamed what had happened. That the jar wasn't real. But I knew better. My mind was bending in all the wrong ways. I didn't know what to do. I could feel Brian's gaze penetrating me. He was eyeballing me, daring me to look inside the bottom drawer. His words whispering inside the attic of my mind made me do it. I opened the drawer. I screamed. The jar was stuck to a bag of clementines. Vile black ooze leaked all over the clementines, coating the entire drawer. The eyeball blinked. Then, suddenly, another eyeball appeared. Now there were two eyeballs. They stopped moving and stared at me, blinking randomly. The grotesque water, it wasn't water, but I don't know what else to call it, had floaties circling around it. Floaties that looked like dried blood. Brian and Ethan snickered. Mad and scared and completely frazzled, I dashed into the living room holding the jar. This! I shouted. Brian and Ethan shared a look. Brian, who was slurring his words, spoke up. Ah, oh, you've discovered my soup. He looked pleased. Would you like to try some? My legs wobbled. The jar threatened to slide from my fingers. But I held on. Held on for dear life. No way I was mopping up this abominable substance. Brian loomed over me and swiped the jar. Then, to my horror, he fetched a bowl and poured the contents into it. The eyeballs bounced as they bobbed into the soup bowl. A strange and sickly smell desecrated the kitchen. Trembling, I watched Brian serve up the eyeball soup. When he offered me some, I refused. I've always been a fussy eater, but this was infallible. Instead, I watched in revulsion as Brian helped himself, grumbling about how ungrateful I was while slurping the soup. The eyeballs crunched as he chewed. I raced into my bedroom and slammed the door. Eventually, I slept. The following morning, I automatically went to the fridge for some OJ. The jar greeted me, bubbling with matching eyeballs. It watched me as I retrieved my precious OJ. To my dismay, the juice jug was empty. Since neither of my roommates liked OJ, I was perplexed. Also perplexing, and downright disturbing, was that the eyeball soup turned orange. Orange like my juice. My mind snapped. Without a second thought, I clutched the wretched jar with both hands, ready to dump its contents down the drain. Screw Brian and his deplorable eating habits. I'd deal with him later. When the eyeballs started blinking simultaneously, I flinched, causing me to drop the jar, spilling its contents all over the kitchen floor. I freaked out. Panic and fear and anger collided. No way was I cleaning that sickening soup. Instead, I banged on Brian's door. Brian was nowhere to be found. Probably buying food from whatever place in hell he gets it from. Reluctantly, I set about mopping up the mess. It was like mopping a puddle of greasy glue. It took way more effort than it should have. When I finally finished, I had to use three rolls of paper towel plus two rags. 
I quickly got ready for work. The bills won't pay themselves. All day, I thought of the jar. Then, something dawned on me. Something terrible. I hadn't mopped up the eyeballs. Those blinking eyeballs stayed with me all day. This may sound paranoid, but I could feel them watching me. Hell, even now, as I type away on my laptop, they're watching me. Watching me type the story. Except, of course, this isn't a story. This is my life. The eyeballs must have rolled away, but where? The grimy goop got everywhere, forcing me to clean behind the fridge and under the stove. This made no sense. Later that night, I confronted Brian. When I brought up the jar, he shrugged and shot me a nasty look. A look that could scare a grizzly bear. It was obvious I was pissing him off, but I didn't care. Brian grabbed a tall boy and retreated to his room, and warned me never to broach the subject again. Frantically, I went in search of the missing eyeballs. It's difficult to explain my reasoning, except that I was exasperated. Finally, I opened the fridge. I'd been avoiding it for obvious reasons. And alas, staring back at me was... the jar. Except, the eyeballs no longer looked like Brian's. How could they? The eyeballs were blue. Blue. Just like mine. Today's story was written by Marcus Starr. Marcus is a very talented author. Uh, he posts on Reddit as Call Me Star. I'll include a link in the description below. And also include a link to his new book. Uh, he has a collection of creepy short stories out right now on Amazon titled Monsters in the Moonlight. So I hope you'll all check that out on Amazon. Please look at the description below for the link to Monsters in the Moonlight by Marcus Starr. Become a channel member today for early access, bonus videos, and special emojis only available to members. Check out the description below or click the join button for more info. Today's video was supported by patrons like Mark from Earth, Crimson Muse, Joy Burton, Diane Showers, Mark Zawal, Cheryl James, Pick Your Sticker, Teddy Dog, Glue 404, Mamakato, Dante Kincaid, Zarin Ray, Angela Dunavant, Larry Ann 50, Devin Kyle, Timothy Baird, Ajeti, Bert Turner, Bajani Aspinall, Michael Pierce, Big Joe, Carrie Harkonnen, LaDonna Spivey, Scott Tanaka, Tom Stewart, Sherman Davis, Bryce Shelton, Susan McClendon, Elise Batisse, Lisa and the Cult Jam, Open Circuit, Fabulavore, Raymond Jaggers, That Darn Fox, Raison Detra, Kai Gaming 99, Wendy Burns, The Wendigo, Michael Squishy Park, The Gem Star, Vault 77 Citizen, Puppy Dan, Clovis Wolf, Elder Jelm, Derek Prey, Elder Being, KC Hawaii, Rob T, Tragic Mermaid, Darren Fishnaller, Cloves and Oye Harris, Roe Underwood, Florida Man Luke, Bethany's Mom, Winter's Kiss, Sam Brook, The White Stag, Corgi Connection, No Name, Marta Cara, Professor Elm, Kathy Barrickman, Cybard Sands, Steve Hennessy, Melanie Sanders, The Archivist, Rob Smith, Term 4, Naz Razio, J. David Wellman Jr., Parker Lewis, Monica Moya, and DMaster311. If you'd like to help support the channel, please consider joining my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Jordan Group Horror. As a patron, you get access to bonus videos and content. You'll be credited at the end of every video going forward. And if you decide to stay for three months, I'll name a character after you which will be featured in a Hollow's End story. Links to join the Patreon are in the description. Thanks everyone for listening. Please like, subscribe, and comment to help the channel continue to grow. It really does help out a lot. And see you again next time at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time.